Here we are tonight for our June virtual meeting. We're going to be featuring small streams, gear, tips, and getting stealthy with Wade Pratt. So I'm very excited to introduce to you Wade Pratt from New Jersey. And uh, Wade is in pursuit of wild trout. That's what he's mostly excited about these days. And he is also a blogger and he is also has an IGTV, uh, the drag free drift. So definitely check out Wade on social media as well on Instagram. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Wade. Well, uh, thank you so much, Kelly, uh, for that kind introduction. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, presenting this to all of you. Um, United Women on the Fly is an organization that I greatly admire you know, for their uh, stance on conservation, on in inclusion, on education, and you know, proper fish handling. And I'm just so proud to contribute. A uh, little bit about me. I started fly fishing and tying in 1998. I was about, um, about 13 years old when I got started. And I focused, focused mostly on saltwater and warm water species because I was a kid with a bicycle. And I grew up in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, which is you know, what a lot of people know is the Jersey shore and really, you know, got my bearings in fly fishing through fly fishing for saltwater species like striped bass, bluefish, and even the hickory shad runs that we had. I, I've been doing that for a long time. In fact, that rod that you see in that picture uh, was my go-to saltwater fly rod, my nine weight for 23 years. And I just broke it on a striped bass a week ago. Uh, so I'm a little heartbroken over that, but I'll get over it. But anyhow, May 9th, 2015, that was my first trout on the fly and it changed everything. I know it's kind of cliche to say that trout changed your life, but really, you know, I had, I had put aside fly fishing for a couple of years for college and, and career purposes and was at a point where I desperately needed it back in my life. And, you know, growing up at the Jersey shore, I didn't realize the, trout fisheries that were within, you know, a 70 mile drive from home. And I stumbled into some knowledge of one particular stream. I went one day with gear that I'd had since I was a teenager with no clue what I was doing, just the three weight and some woolly buggers and landed my first trout. And, you know, that's just over seven years ago. And since then, I have caught wild trout, wild or native trout in 11 states and two Canadian provinces. And there's they're just a, whoops, sorry, few shots of, uh, you know, some of the adventures I've had uh, spanning, you know, a lot of North America. Uh, I've also been tying since I was a kid. That vice right there is the same Ranzetti vice I've had since I was 13. And, you know, I love, I love catching on my flies more than I like tying uh, itself. I refuse to fish flies that I didn't tie myself unless I'm on vacation. I have no other choice, but the act of sitting down and tying flies, I find often to be very tedious and I try to simplify it as much as possible. And, you know, I, I found effective patterns that I can tie, you know, in under 10 minutes, most of the time under five minutes that work just as well as your more intricate patterns. Um, but, you know, I do, I do take pride in tying them well and, there, there is an excitement, a joy every time I catch a fish on my own flies. But let's talk about the type of fly fishing that we're going to be discussing tonight. Small mountain streams. Now, I do want to be specific about the type of water that we're fishing because what might be a small stream to one person may be you know, a large stream to another person. For instance, if you spend all of your time fishing a huge system like the Snake River in Idaho or uh, the Bow River in Calgary, Anything, you know, smaller than that might be considered small, but uh, may not be the same for everybody else. So what I'm talking about here are your higher elevation waters. Uh, typically, you're, you're climbing to get to these places. Uh, these are often headwaters of larger rivers. Uh, for instance, in my area in the Northeast, a lot of the rivers I fish are tributaries or headwaters of the Delaware River, which separates New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They're mostly fed by natural springs, rain, snow melt, and they're typically crystal clear, which is wonderful. You know, a lot of times you can sight fish, but at the same time, it creates a lot of obstacles for anglers. 
Uh, these streams are not big. They're typically at their widest, 12 feet wide. They can be, you know, sometimes as narrow as two to three feet and still hold some native brook trout. They're not typically deep. They're usually pretty shallow. You know, I've had, uh, I've had uh, brown trout come after my flies with their dorsals sticking out of the surface. As long as they can, you know, cover themselves, the, they'll be in it. So uh, these are, we're talking typically shallow water here. They don't, it doesn't get too deep. Deep gradients, you know, often these streams are going up a mountain or going up a hillside. Uh, there's an incline and that creates one of my favorite features plunge pools, falls. Uh, those are some of my favorite ones to fish. And we're going to talk, uh, you know, a, a decent amount about that today and how to approach those types of features. So a little more detail about small mountain streams. Um, in terms of, you know, bug life, hatches are typically not as diverse as bigger lowland streams. You know, there are exceptions to everything and everything I'm going to talk about in this presentation. One, there are exceptions to everything that I say. So common insects on these streams, at least in the Northeast, from what I've found, uh, we get a lot of blue winged olive hatches. Um, you know, they're prominent um, late winter through the spring, typically. Uh, at other random times, we get a lot of caddis in, in, in the Northeast. They tend to, different species of caddis hatch at different times of year. We get a lot, uh, basically all through spring, there are different types of caddis hatching. And I know out West in the summer, you get a lot of big caddis hatches. And then in the fall, you know, we get the, the black caddis hatches and other species of caddis. So caddis are usually a pretty safe bet year round because those larvae are in the water a lot of the year. Same thing with stoneflies, specifically little black stoneflies. They're, they're not your, you know, your big stones that, that you see out West, you know, your, your two inch long stoneflies, little black stoneflies, I'll show a picture in a second, are tiny, um, but they are uh, very prominent in the winter and early spring in uh, a lot of these small streams and midges. Midges are a year round thing. They're everywhere. They're larvae, they're hatches, they're always around. And, you know, that lack of biodiversity is something to consider. You know, it could happen for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of the things that I've uh, I've heard is that the higher elevation you go, the you know the thinner the air, and you know insects like other animals just don't survive at those altitudes as well. So here are some of those insects I'm talking about. You know, your caddis larva, which uh, I always feel like I go too small with my caddis larva because they're usually so big in the water. Uh, your adult caddis there, I believe that's a that's a black caddis. Um, your little black stone flies, they're small, that's a stone fly. Um, and then your blue winged olives, and that's the adult blue winged olive, not the nymph stage, uh, the, the betis. So the type of trout that you're typically targeting on these streams, they're almost always wild or native, uh, unless you, know, you have the un unfortunate tendency of, of some state fisheries to stock these waters, even though they can sustain wild and native trout. But typically you're running into wild and native fish, especially as you go higher up in the mountains. And they're typically small. But they are incredibly colorful. That's one thing I love about them. You know, I, I really rate my trout on those small streams by color uh, more than anything. And they're aggressive, advantageous feeders. So really, they're not so picky about fly selection. On these streams, matching the hatch isn't such an issue. There's a lot of, honestly, like... You know, it's a harder life for those small stream trout. They don't have as much, like I said, as much biodiversity, as much food coming in front of them as uh, trout on a small, on a bigger stream, uh, you know, where you might have like five or six different things hatching or emerging at once. Uh, so they kind of take what they can get and they're less picky about flies, but there are other factors that make them very difficult because they're easily spooked. Clear water um, makes them very, very difficult to sneak up on. And they're used to being picked off by predatory birds, uh, especially eagles, great blue herons. You know, I've been in situations in the Northeast where it seems like every time I move up 50 feet on a stream, I'm spooking this great blue heron that's set up in the spot and he just keeps going up and up and up and who knows how many fish he's picking off. And same thing, you know, out West, I've had, I've been fishing runs in streams where bald eagles have just cruised through and just smashed a, a small cutty that I may have caught had he not been there. Um, but with trout, you know, they, they, they see well uh, in all directions for the most part. 
know, so with them, you've got two serious blind spots. You've, because from side to side, they see with monocular vision, you know, with one eye on either side, straight ahead and up, they see with binocular vision, both eyes, your really only blind spots are directly behind them and directly below them. And good luck getting below them where they can't see you. So you're looking to get directly behind them. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but for a visual, you know, these are some of the, the trout that you're getting. Absolutely beautiful, incredibly colorful fish. These are all fish caught in the Northeast. Specifically, all of these uh, were caught in New Jersey. Uh, you know, we have our native Northern Appalachian brook trout to the top left. We have wild brown trout to the top right and then wild rainbows down below. And, you know, if you've seen anything out West, I haven't had as much time to fish those small streams out West as I'd like, but some of the you know, cutthroat and gila trout and golden trout that are, they only live in those small, tiny mountain streams and they're absolutely gorgeous, even you know, more beautiful than, than these fish. So one of the things that I love about small mountain streams is, is the therapeutic aspect of it. You know, you're, you, you've got a lot of things going for you with these small mountain streams, specifically uh, there's the mindfulness aspect. And I feel like that's prevalent through all of fly fishing. You have to be living in the moment. Uh, you can't bring your baggage with you uh, onto the water. Otherwise you're not going to have a successful day. You need to be completely focused on what you're doing. It's the same with, with small stream fly fishing and the sound of running water. Uh, there's something just so soothing about that. And there, there's a lot of evidence, you know, to, to back that up. Uh, it's one of the reasons why People have sleep machines that make the sound of running water because it is calming. Uh, although sometimes, like a couple of weeks ago, it can be, you know, it could work to your detriment because I was enjoying the sound of running water when the largest black bear I've ever seen in New Jersey was about 50 feet behind me. And I had no clue until I did a double take. <laughs> so, but at the same time, uh, it was a wonderful experience. It was amazing. That bear did not care that I was there. And it was, a, it was an amazing thing to see. Typically, these streams aren't pressured. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of anglers don't know about them. Uh, you know, a lot of anglers are, are happy fishing the bigger lowland waters for stock trout, and they don't typically see the appeal of small stream wild trout. So, a lot of the times, these streams uh, you will have entirely to yourself, and it's just a matter of making the hike. Sometimes it can be a long hike to get to them. Uh, one particular stream I fished two weeks ago. I rarely ever get out on the weekends because I just don't like competing for water. And the stream, I, I got there first light and no one was there. Typically on these really small mountain streams, if someone's already there, I just drive to the next nearest one because these fish are so spooky that someone jumps ahead of you and, you know, and is fishing that water ahead of you. You're, you're going to cut your numbers by like 75% because a lot of those fish are shut down from you know, seeing one fly come through there. But I got there on a Sunday, had the place entirely to myself. It was a beautiful day. It's a fairly, you know, fairly well-known stream, though not highly pressured, but no one fished it. Everyone was fishing the, the bigger lowland waters, going for those bigger, uh, you know, stocked and sometimes wild trout. So I had it all to myself. And that connection to nature, you know, some of the things I've seen on these small streams, um, it just you know, it blows you away. Just the, you know, the natural world is so incredible. Like the, the bear that I mentioned, you know, see them uh, every so often on the water, uh, a lot of wildlife that I didn't even know existed in the Northeast. I see wild minks all the time, uh, foxes, like, you know, yeah, I knew they were there, but uh, a lot are just really cool experiences that you, you feel more a part of nature in those moments than you do uh, then you feel like you're intruding on it. You feel like you're one with it when you're fishing these small streams, if you're doing it right. If you're doing it quiet and you know not spooking uh, the natural world around you, like this is where I was, where I saw the bear. Absolutely beautiful stream, and look at that incline. You know, you're you're climbing uphill to get to to get to those trout. So specifically, when to fish these streams, these small mountain streams, you can hit them year round, just as long as you're a conscientious angler, especially in the summer months uh, when it gets warmer. Um, typically, these spring-fed waters as long as it's not too hot and you hit it early enough in the day. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. You can, you can fish these year round and some of these spring fed creeks uh, or some of these small mountain streams um, are also tailwaters that, that run off of larger reservoirs. And, you know, those, I, I fished some of those in, in August in the Northeast and, you know, 
they were so cold, I lost feeling in my ankles after 10 minutes in the water. So if you do it right, and if you check your temperatures, you can fish these year round, but they're prime. They're, they're at their best mid to late spring. I mean, that's just a given with, with trout, typically anywhere your spring, uh, springtime is going to be your most successful because your conditions are the, the best, the trout are, you know, turning on after, after the cold winter, uh, you know, you've got your runoff, you've got more rain, colder temps, more steady flows. And the one great thing about these streams is they recover really fast after a rain. And I, I learned this lesson probably about four years ago on a, I was out on a trip out to Virginia. My wife and I uh, we're on a weekend trip out to Virginia near George Washington Mas National Forest. And I wanted to fish a creek that was right next to the Airbnb we were staying. It was a lowland creek. It was a fairly well-known um, stream, you know, decent size. And the whole drive there, the whole three-hour drive there, it absolutely poured on us, just downpour the entire time. Get up in the morning and the entire stream is blown out. Complete chocolate milk, just, just flooded. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm thinking, not going to get any fish in Virginia. I'm not going to check that state off my list. And then we went to a local fly shop and they took out the contour map and they said, ah, if you head up, if you climb up into the mountains, even though that rain was just 12 hours ago, you climb up into the mountains uh, and hit this small little blue line, you, you may find some fish. And what I found 12 hours after a massive heavy rain uh, was one of the most pristine wild trout streams I've ever fished. So a lot of the times these waters will recover quickly. You know, trout season opened up in, in New Jersey early, early April. And everyone I know was, was moaning that they, uh, they couldn't get into any fish that weekend because all the lowland streams were blown out. I hit the highest elevation stream that I knew. And yes, it was high, but it was incredibly fishable. I had it entirely to myself and I just caught nothing but absolutely gorgeous wild browns and native brooks all day long. So if you get some rain, head up into the into the mountains uh the, the one downside is these are typically lacking in usgs data usgs is the u.s geological service if you don't know that you know that um charts the flows of rivers a lot of times they don't put gauges in these small streams so you your best bet is to look at the waters that these small streams flow into and you know if you get a feel for what the good and bad flows are for uh for those rivers you can usually gauge whether or not these are fishable. But like I said, you know, 24 hours after a heavy rain, they'll usually be cleared up and, and very fishable. So um, definitely don't let that discourage you. So let's talk about gear now. I am very much a, a proponent of stealth on these waters. Like I said, this is clear water. These are spooky fish. You know, they've got excellent vision. Basically, the only, like I said before, the only blind spots directly below them or directly behind them. And they've got that lateral line to help them too, you know, to sense vibrations in the water. So good luck sneaking up on these fish. Uh, but I'm going to show you some, some ways to do it that will definitely help out. Uh, drab clothing is such an important thing, I feel like. Take a look. That, that's a picture of me fly fishing the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Uh, I'm pretty well camouflaged in that picture, I think. And I am basically right on top of a section of water and I'll, and those fish can't see me one because of how i'm dressed and two because we have one of my favorite features here the plunge pool um which you've got the higher plunge pool that i'm standing directly behind and sort of below and then the one behind it those fish that i'm targeting directly ahead of me can't see me because i'm directly behind them i'm at basically eye level with them but those drab, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off topic here, but those, those drab colors, the, your olives, your dark greens, your browns, your tans, your grays, uh, try to avoid bright colors, fluorescence, things like that uh, on the water. They can see that some of them can see it from really far away. Um, and as for boots, um, I recommend sticking with rubber soles. I used to be very much against studs because of the fish's lateral line and, you know, that, that feeling of metal against gravel. I know they can feel that to an extent in the water. Uh, but I've also taken enough heavy spills to know that it's not worth it to, you know, break a hip, uh, you know, two miles up a mountain stream with no one there to help me and no reception. So I do fish with studs and honestly, I, I I'm just more careful and I, you know, I crawl around a lot more 
um, just to compensate for the, for the grinding of the studs on gravel. And I know some people maybe think, well, use felt soles on these small streams. Uh, you know, felt soles don't make any noise and they're, they have incredible traction, but you know, they also transmit bacteria and parasites from stream to stream. They're almost impossible to completely wash out, uh, you know, and get all of the harmful bacteria and parasites out. I've seen what whirling disease can do to streams. I've seen it destroy entire, uh, you know, native cutthroat trout lakes out in Alberta within like a week of it being detected. It's really sad. So uh, I definitely recommend avoiding felt soles entirely. Use a small net. I, re I recommend a small net with tight woven rubber mesh because you're dealing with small fish here. Like your average size trout is going to be around like four to six inches, but sometimes you get them even smaller than that. And it can be a real pain uh, if one swims through the net and then gets the fly all hung up in the netting. So tight woven rubber mesh so they, they can't get out and, and mess things up. And some of those little guys are, are, are so beautiful. You know, you want to get a picture of them. So uh, it stinks sometimes when they swim through the net. My first ever uh, native, northern native Appalachian brook trout swam through the net and I couldn't get a picture of it. And I was, I was pretty sad about that. <clears throat> but I've gotten a lot since then. So I guess I can, uh, I can be okay with it. <clears throat> also as for rods, let's, let's get to the actual rod and reel. I recommend going light. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about, uh, overplaying these fish because really you're in control. Most of the time you're mostly, like I said, you're mostly running into to six to uh, four to six inch fish. Occasionally you do get a big one. You know, I've gotten them, I've hooked fish up to 18 inches typically in these, or sometimes in these small streams, I've landed them up to like 15 or 16, something, you know, with a light rod. Yeah. You might, they might overpower you, but realistically on, on these small waters, you might get into one of those big fish once every couple times you're out. Uh, so I don't, I, I think like letting those fish play a little bit on the smaller rods, um, it's definitely more fun than going heavy on the random off chance that you're going to get into one of these monsters. Uh, and they're so smart anyway, that they always find a way to hang you up on something, but I recommend zero to three weight. Um, fiberglass or bamboo is ideal. I love fiberglass. I know bamboo is on the expensive side for a lot of people and I don't own a bamboo rod. Um, but I do have a couple fiberglass rods specifically. I have, a six foot two inch two weight that I absolutely love fishing on these small streams. A six inch native brook trout will put a full bend on that rod. So much fun. And I also recommend a short rod because a lot of these small streams are, you know, especially in spring and summer, uh, there's a lot of tight brush and overhanging trees and very little room to cast. So highly, highly recommend a shorter rod, nothing bigger than seven, six. Uh, even seven, six can lead to some problems sometimes. And then as for the reel, the click reel is an awesome choice for small streams. You don't need that powerful drag and that drag that you're not using at all on these small streams is adding a lot of extra weight to your gear. So click reels, highly recommend that. Um, these are two different setups I have. And uh, the click reel is to the right. It's the sage click. And if you look very closely there, I don't know how closely you can look, but on the inside of the spool, there are uh, little teeth because there it's basically one giant gear. And there's a piece of plastic that connects with that gear and creates your drag tension. You don't actually have a drag on these reels. So a lot of weight uh, saved there. That, that reel is incredibly light. And that is uh, you know my one weight uh, graphite setup. It's a seven foot six rod. And I also want to illustrate with, with these two rods, um, you know, fly fishing, a lot of times, one, one of the things I criticize it for is how elitist it can be and how inaccessible it can be for some people, you know, in terms of price. But you don't need to spend, you know, an arm and a leg to, to get a, a really good setup, especially for, for small mountain streams. So if you look to the left, that setup there, that rod is a glass rod, a fiberglass rod, six foot two, two eight. Uh, it's the Cabela's CGR that, that rod retails for $70. And that reel, I won it in an Instagram contest, but that's a cheeky Tyro that goes for 130. So with the line, that whole setup is under $300. Uh, 
Uh, whereas to the right, uh, my wife has a habit of spoiling me at Christmas and she spoiled me this year that that set up rod, reel, line, everything included, uh, could cost you over $1,200 out the door. Uh, she is really good at sniffing out deals. And I think she paid just over half that, but you know, it just kind of shows the, the difference in price that you can pay in fly fishing. And honestly, they both have their, their pluses and, and, and their downsides and, um, you know, their pros and their cons. And I love both those rods, even though they're both, I, I love them equally, basically, even though they're both completely different price points. Floating line, essentially, and that's typical for, for most trout fishing, unless you're using streamers and you want to sink tip or something. Um, but and I recommend a natural colored line for fly fishing these small streams. I prefer either, um, I, I have on the two weight, the Cortland Spring Creek. It's a hunter green color. It's a really deep green. And then I have on the one weight, I have a Rio, a Rio small stream line. It's one of their higher end lines. Um, it's a slightly same, it's green as well. It's just a light, slightly lighter shade. Um, but both are really low memory lines. They don't coil on the reel. Um, cause that can create a lot of problems too. You know, if you're not getting smooth casts off, um, you know, these trout don't forgive mistakes. So low memory line keeps the line straight. You don't have to stretch it out. You don't have to do a lot of maintenance on it. It's lightweight, you know, these one weight, two weight lines, they hit the water super soft. And, you know, they blend in pretty well because of their color. As for leader, you know, some companies are finally starting to catch on to the importance of a short leader for small stream. Uh, but up until like the past year, they were hard to come by in your average fly shop. Typically, what I do is I buy a seven and a half foot leader and I on the thicker end of the taper, I cut off a foot of it and then I tie a new perfection loop on. So I'm using a six to six and a half foot leader. Uh, typically on these small streams, I'm going five or six X, usually six X. And then I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of tippet rings. I like saving my, my leaders. Um, I don't do the double or triple surgeon. Oftentimes, maybe it's just, I'm not good at tying them, but they, they fail me too often. Uh, a lot of times when I break off fish, it's on the surgeon knot. So I prefer tippet rings and I recommend, you know, if you notice there, I, I keep saying nylon, I, I don't use fluorocarbon really at all. And you'd think it would matter on these small streams where it's super crystal clear water, uh, but it really doesn't. You know, I still get plenty of fish on these waters and I prefer the nylon because it gives me the option to switch between dry flies and nymphs quickly. I don't have to switch out an entire liter because you know, some, if you don't know, nylon floats fluorocarbon tends to sink. Uh, even though fluorocarbon has its brand advantages as far as abrasion goes and overall strength, but um, I just find nylon is the more versatile for jumping between types of presentations. So that stealthy approach that, that has been um, you know, mentioned in all of the posters for, uh, for this event, I definitely want to talk about that now. So I am very, very patient. A lot of the times before I approach a section of water, I will take a deep breath. I will look at it and plan out exactly what I'm going to do because I'm not improvising everything. Every move I make is calculated because I do not want to spook these fish in the slightest bit. So uh, I'm crouching a lot of the times. I'm, I'm never walking straight. I never stand straight when I'm approaching these waters. I'll get pretty close, closer than you might think is uh, a safe distance to not spook these fish, but I'm always crouching. Yeah, yeah, it's not great for your lower back and my lower back feels it, believe me. Uh, and a lot of times I'm crawling on my hands and knees. Uh, I, if you do that, I highly recommend waders with padding in the knees uh, because my winter waders are heavily padded in the knees, but my spring waders are not. And a lot of times I forget that, uh, hey, I'm wearing my spring waders and I bang my shin and my knee uh, on something on a rock and it hurts, uh, always approach from downstream. This may be, I, mean, I have a, a quick question. If oh, you yeah. Don't mind. Yeah, sure. It was in the chat, um, because you just talked about your knees. Have you found any knee pads that work well with underweighters? No, I, I've never, ever worn them. Um, I, okay. that, that is probably a really, really good idea. I've always just, 
you know, I have my, I have um, like lower end Orvis waders and, or I wet wade typically in the spring and summer. Um, and then the winter, my Patagonias have knee padding built into them. Uh, so I, I don't have to worry about that, but yeah, that's, that's something that definitely I'd recommend because, you know, my knees can get absolutely destroyed knees and shins just wrecked in a day. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, again, you know, we, uh, I talked about the, the trout's line of sight approaching from downstream is always a necessity. Uh, if you do, or if you are in a situation where you, you know, where your like access is further upstream and you have to walk downstream, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just hit the trail and walk the entire river, uh, and won't enter until I'm at the point where I'm like, all right, I'm going to turn around now and then fish my way upstream back to my car. Uh, or if you do it, if you, you know, fish, um, approaching from upstream, like do a wide loop around before you enter, you know, the goal is to not get in front of these fish to where they can see you. And again, you know, I, I use that as an example. I'm, I'm crouched down. The, the water is basically at level with my chest and I'm behind those fish. They cannot see me where they are because trout are always facing the current. They're always feeding in the current. They're always using current to, uh, you know, push oxygen, uh, push the water through the gills. So they're always facing the current. And it's typically tight quarters casting, you know, a lot of overhanging trees, a lot of branches. Before I cast, I always do a 360 look to see what's around me, to see what kind of cast I can get off. And even then, sometimes I'm hanging up on things behind me that I didn't realize were there, especially uh, in the early spring when those branches don't have leaves on them yet. Sometimes, you know, your depth perception, noticing those tiny little twigs that are hanging there isn't so great. But I highly recommend non-traditional casts, bow and arrow casting, roll casting, water load, and then flip upstream. Water load is, you know, you let the fly drift downstream a bit and use the resistance of the current to help you flip it upstream. Um, a lot of people are intimidated by the bow and arrow cast I've seen. You know, people are like, oh, I don't know how to do that. And I feel like a lot of that comes from um, it being called a bow and arrow cast, because I feel like with a bow and arrow cast, if, if I'm visible, am I visible right now, Kelly? Like, can, can, okay. So like, say you got the rod in your forward hand and you've got the fly and you're, I feel, feel like people's instinct is to pull back the fly and, you know, like release it like that and shoot it out. Like that's not the way I approach a bow and arrow on the water. I keep the line tight on my thumb or on my uh, finger that's holding the rod. So that when I release, that line isn't shooting through the guides. If it shoots through the guides, then you lose control of it. It's hard to predict where that fly is going to go. But if you have it tight, uh, you know, held tight so that that line can't go any further than the length that it is from the, the, the rod tip, I use the rod. I, I push the rod forward to create the resistance and I hold the, the fly in place. I never move the hand that's holding the fly. I create the... Um, you know, the, 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 the pressure with the hand, the rod, hold, the, sorry, the hand holding rod, I'm stumbling over my words here. And then I just let go and it slingshots out and it's not shooting through the guides. It's going the exact distance I want it to exactly where I want it to. And, um, one thing too, a lot of people hook themselves with the bow and arrow. I always make sure I've got the hook pointed upwards and I'm holding the, the fly. So it's basically upside down. So the hook's pointing up. So it never gets me. Uh, and if you're using a tandem rig, always hold the bottom fly and, you know, make each cast count. You don't get second chances with these trout. You, you, you get one bad drift. A lot of the times, you know, if you rip it through, uh, because you didn't get it where you wanted to, if it makes some kind of unnatural movement, you're shutting down that whole section of water. Um, that's the one thing that I've found like I, uh, with using that, uh, that one weight, sage dart the the higher end rod with the fiberglass i'm good at casting that that little rod but the accuracy on that sage dart has made that first cast count every time and the quality of the fish that i've gotten has been uh, since using that rod has been out of this world because my first cast goes exactly where i need it to and i'm getting that prime presentation almost every time and you know you're you're fishing a short leader but a lot of the times, you know, your rod, if you look in that picture, the rod is right over the water. So keeping the line out of the water whenever possible is always a great, uh, great tip. 
here's another picture. Um, you know, the, the deeper water can, is my mouse visible? Okay, cool. Uh, so, you know, this is the tail, the back end of what I'm fishing and this is the head. So I'm back here on my knee or on one knee, you know, very, very carefully approaching this. I'm pretty close, but at the same time, you know, those fish really aren't detecting me fishing the, the tail out here and then working my way up to the even better water up here. All right. So the type of rig that I use, I use two different styles here. I, I use a specific type of nymphing rig and then a specific type of dry dropper rig. The nymphing rig is short. So you have, if you notice the illustration here, you have a pinch on indicator. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to show you. It's in the next slide, a, a visual of what that is. It's, it's a um, little foam indicator that has adhesive on it. And you pinch it around the line and the adhesive sticks and stays in place. So you can't adjust that indicator once it's on, but it's made of a foam that's so, so dense that it always stays floating, but it's also super lightweight. So it doesn't splash on the water. A lot of your, you know, airlock indicators, you can't use those on these small streams. I have airlocks. I use them, um, you know, when I'm out on bigger water, um, especially like Euronymphing. If I'm out of reach of the section I'm trying to Euronymph, I'll throw on an indicator and a big airlock indicator and get it out there. Use an airlock here. That thing's going to splash and spook everything within 30 feet. So those pinch on indicators are key. And if you look from the pinch on to the tippet ring, I'm using about two and a half to three feet. And then the tippet ring, I'm branching off with, with two flies. You know, I've got the main uh, tippet, 12 to 16 inches, not too long, with the point fly. And then the droppers off the tippet ring on a four to six inch tag. I even like, honestly, I even like to go for shorter than four inches. To be honest, the shortest I can get the tag, the better it is for me. Because I feel like those tags just tend to uh, get like tangled up in the main tippet or in the leader itself. So the shorter the tag, the less it's going to get tangled up in anything I find. But four to six is, is safe. Some people can't tie, even on cold days, I have a hard time tying with those short, short tags. Uh, so, you know, four to six inch, highly recommend. But let's take a look now. Um, oh, so this technique, you can use it year round. I recommend it for your higher flows, but you can use it typically all year. Just summer is probably the time when you're going to use the least. And it's best in higher flows, best in your deeper pools. Here's that indicator that I talked about, the white foam pinch on indicator. Highly recommended. it. Like I said before, it's dense but lightweight, so it stays floating. And you could put surprisingly heavy flies underneath that. You typically don't need to on small water, but these indicators, though tiny and super lightweight, they can, they can carry a lot underneath them. Uh, and like I said, they don't hit the water hard at all. And the white ones, I highly recommend the white ones because it just looks like foam in the water. The trout aren't spooked by it at all. The only downside to that is when the sun hits the water, like if you're fishing, you know, afternoon, sometimes you can lose sight of it. But in all honesty, those trout hit so aggressively on those small streams. A lot of times you're feeling that take too. So, um, the one thing I do though there is if I do lose sight of the indicator, I'll, I'll tight line. Uh, I'll just keep the tight line on the fly so that when that fish takes it, you know, I, I feel it before anything. But um, my recommendation, three and a half to four feet from your point fly. Now, what I do is when I, you know, when you're not using your, uh, your fly, when you're walking from section to section, you put the fly in the, the hook eyelet that's directly above the handle of the rod. So that's how I measure out where I'm going to put my indicator. I don't bring a tape measure with me or anything. I put my point fly in the hook eyelet. I tighten up. So, you know, I'm ready to walk on the trail, but I have my rods measured out so that I know that my sweet spot is if I put the pinch on indicator right at the point where um, my fifth guide from the tip is, so I, I, I put it on there and for my one weight, I know it's um, seven guides down. So that sweet spot is three and a half foot to four foot. Uh, that measurement for me is on my two weight, that fifth guide uh, measures to about uh, 43 inches from the point fly to that fifth guide. 
And then on my one weight, it's 44 inches. So 44, uh, 43, 44 inches, you're, you're talking three and a half uh, feet right there. So, so just over three and a half feet. Uh, I think that's perfect. You know, and you don't have to worry about dragging bottom with, with this type of, uh, with this type of fly fishing, because these fish are aggressive. They'll come from the bottom to chase the fly. I've seen them come out from underneath shelves, six feet away from my drift to, to slam a nymph that's drifting through a run. So I don't recommend using shot or flies with heavy tungsten beads on this type of water, because one, you're, you're, you're hitting the bottom right away. You don't really need to do that, especially since if you're fishing these plunge pools, the suction of those um, those falls at those plunge pools will bring the fly down deeper. And with the, with shot, with tungsten beads, you're not getting that, that really natural drift because you want it to be kind of flowing in the current. Cause like I said, th these trout are aggressive. They'll, they'll come after it, but you know, they're not like your lowland stream fish that if it's not right in their line of sight, flowing or, uh, drifting right past their face, they're not going to take it. These, these fish will come out from distances to get these flies. And um, a side note to that, even if you see them rising, they'll, they'll come after, uh, they'll come after nymphs. They're, they're, they're advantageous. They will take whatever, just as long as it's, just as long as you don't spook them and it's presented in a natural way. So I typically stick to brass beads and lead free wire underneath my flies. And, you know, I, uh, like I said before, I, I tie all my flies and I, I put lead free wire uh, specifically this size, the 0 0.015 is what I use for, for my nymphs for small stream fishing, just like five or six wraps of it right behind the bead on, uh, on all of my, uh, my nymphs, my point fly nymphs. And we'll talk about what type of fly I use as my point fly. So the point fly bigger, you would think, okay, these are small stream fish. These are four to six inch trout. I'm going to go with like a size 20, a size 22. No, uh, <laughs> they, you, you want to get these fish's attention. Cause like I said, they're not picky. They're, I, I use big flies, these bright flies. Uh, my favorite is a soft hackle pheasant tail, uh, that bright gold bead, the flowing hackle, it really gets their attention. I use a size 12 is my go-to. Uh, and like I said, brass bead, just a few lead wrap or lead wire wraps underneath, uh, the, the fly. And, you know, soft hackle, CDC, those materials, anything that flows in the water creates life to the fly um, and things that get their attention. Brass beads, like you see there. Uh, on that fly in that picture, there's a um, peacock colored dubbing in front of the soft hackle, uh, right about right there. You can barely see it, but it's there. Sometimes I use ice dub, something that has a little bit of flash, or you could use the hot spot if you've, you know, if you've seen those flies that have the orange or fluorescent red wraps either at the collar or at the, the back end right by the tail, something that gets their attention. Um, you know, the soft hackle pheasant tail is my favorite or another similar fly, the guide's choice hair's ear. I t and again, you know, I avoid those, I avoid jig flies because they're all, all jig flies have tungsten beads for the most part. So just your standard nymph hooks with, you know, brass beads, lead free wire, just Heavy enough to get it down, but not so heavy where you're getting snagged every two seconds or you're just dragging across the bottom. You want that natural drift. You want to be right in that zone, probably, you know, five or six inches off the bottom. Or, you know, if you're even higher than that, like I said, they'll come out and get it. The dropper that I tie the, um, off that tag, that short tag, that's where you put your smaller fly. Uh, I recommend matching the hatch there, a natural pattern. A lot of times I'll just throw on a small caddis larva. Um, sometimes I even get a little crazy. I throw on an ice dub caddis larva just to get their attention with two flies and it works. Uh, but a lot of the times I'm using like a really, really tiny, uh, pheasant tail, like trying to match those little black stone flies that are in there or that, like I said, that caddis or a WD 40 completely unweighted. A WD 40 is a small nymph that, um, mimics the, um, blue winged olive at its nymph stage and, and slash emerger stage. Uh, it's a great pattern, but yeah, smaller, lighter, unweighted for the dropper. Um, you know, your, your point flies largely the anchor to get it down. But if in my, in my experience, I'm getting 80% of my fish on that point fly. 
And this technique, best spring through fall. Uh, this, oh, sorry, the next technique, the dry dropper. Um, this is effective spring through fall. This is um, not a complex system that I have here. Uh, it's nothing revolutionary, it's simple, but it works well. Um, I know out West, dry dropper fishing's a, a bit different. Like dry dropper fishing, you may have a big stimulator or a big uh, hopper on, and then like three, four feet down to, uh, to the first dropper, and then maybe another foot and a half underneath that to a second dropper. That won't work out here, just a short tag off of that dry fly. Uh, so if you look here, we've got the tippet ring. I know a lot of people don't use um, tippet rings with dry flies. I do. I put floating on them. Um, you know, after I uh, put floating the uh, liquid floating on my fly, my dry fly, I'll put it on the tippet ring as well. And it'll stay up. And if you notice it's starting to sag a bit, just put more floating on it. But that tippet ring, I just, I feel it helps you. It, it makes you able to switch between patterns a lot, uh, a lot better. Um, best in low flows, shallow runs, pockets, uh, you know, your, um, your lower water is, is where this is working best. And you're using, um, you know, like I said, 14 to 18 inches of, of nylon. I, I use six X typically on these waters. I've gone seven X for my dropper, but, um, that's when I tend to break off, uh, cause these fish are aggressive. But that's dry fly again, like with the point fly on the on the nymphing rate, go bigger than you'd think. I use a 10 to 14 dry fly typically on these tiny little streams, visible patterns. My favorite is my go-to is the olive X caddis. Even if caddis aren't hatching, they'll still whack it. Like you wouldn't believe. Those native brook trout strikes are insanely aggressive. Uh stimulators work really well. Terrestrials out out in um New uh New Hampshire, I've had a lot of luck. You know, I've, I've gone out there. I've had a lot of luck with hoppers out there. If, if hoppers are around, uh, those little brook trout will absolutely destroy them. Um, but with floatant, you know, just you use your liquid floatant for the first coating. Second coating, use the dry desiccant floated uh, floatant as needed. If you're noticing the fly starting to sink, you know, um, just wring out some of the water in the fly and dip it in the floatant, you know, little shake tube um, just to dry it out. Uh, I find even when it's the, the colors lightened up from the, the floatant, uh, from the desk and floatant, they tend to hit that sometimes they, they, it becomes more visible. So for the dropper, like I said, a short dropper, 12 to 16 inches, you're talking six to seven X tippet. I, I use seven X cause I feel like sometimes they can see that as see, they can see six X and won't hit the dry fly because they might see the knot on, on the, uh, on the hook bend, but Typically I'm using, you know, I, I prefer six X cause they break off less on the, on the dropper. Um, and I tie it, I tie that tag or sorry, the dropper tip it off of the dry fly hook bend straight to the dropper dropper fly. I use that soft tackle pheasant tail, but typically in a smaller size, a 16 or an 18 and just, you know, not too much weight there because you don't want it to drag down your dry fly. And again, that's the, the fly I'm going with. So just the seasonal breakdown, I want to go through this quickly because I want to get to the, to the types of water before we you know, run out of time. So spring, um, typically it, it's interchanging based on conditions between dry dropper and nymphing. If you got your higher flows and your typical higher flows in spring, you can nymph. Uh, but if you have a lot of that insect activity on the surface, you can uh, you know, work in a dry dropper. Trout tend to be more spread out, more actively feeding. Just beware that you know if you have wild rainbows or or cutties in your system, you know they are spawning in the spring. You want to be careful of that. Uh, summer, I'm exclusively dry dropper fishing. Uh, typically, have lower flows, uh, higher water temps. So I am my my philosophy for those mornings is I get out at first light. I, that's kind of what I do every time. But I'm usually off the water by 8 a.m. at the latest. The second that sun hits the water, I'm gone. Uh, and I'm checking temps even when I get there. And if I don't like, you know, if, if the temp, if for me, my break, breaking point is 65. I don't go higher than 65. If I see 65 degree water temperatures, I go to the next place where it might be cooler. Um, you know, that's that was a spring a, a mountain stream in Tennessee in August. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, fall, uh, mostly dry dropper because you have those lower flows in the fall. The water temps are coming down though. Your, your trout are aggressively feeding, especially in your waters with brooks and browns because they're in pre-spawn mode in the early fall. 
but you know, once they're on their reds, um, you know, in like October, you want to be careful of that. Winter, I'm almost exclusively nymphing. Uh, the flows are lower, but they tend to be steadier. You don't get your dangerous lows in the winter uh, on these, these mountain streams. Uh, but a lot of times you don't get really high flows unless there's a major weather event. Uh, the water temperature colder though, these fish are typically in your deeper pools and runs and they're the best spot I think to get them is in the slow water, right at the edge of a fast seam. Like they're, they're hanging out right on that edge where they can get, uh, you know, a lot of oxygen and also, uh, any food that's passing through. Here's an example of a, a pool in one of these small mountain streams. So the approach that I like to use for this is. I go from tail to head, so that means back to front, and then fish from inside to outside. So if you look at this picture, I'm on the right side. You know, if we're looking upstream, I'm on the right side of this water. So I'm gonna fish the inside from right to left. So I'm gonna first hit the tail of this to, to stick to my, uh, you know, stick to my front, uh, back to front philosophy because you get a lot of fish hanging out in the tail because the current starts to pick up typically at the tail. So, so they're, they're catching what's coming in here right as the current's speeding up. So I'll drift a fly right through this prime water um, and you know, usually pick off a bigger fish there, but I'm careful, like I have written there, to not let them run up to the head and spook anything that might be up there. I just work them back to the net very quickly so that I can hit the middle. So again, work inside to outside. So I'm fishing the water that's closest to me first and then I'm going to hit the next section. If you see here, you got a little shelf right here. You you know drift a dry dropper through here or, or a nymphing rig, and there's usually something sitting in this dark, shady water right there. And then after you've worked the the back in the middle, you work your way up to the head. Fish, um, you know, fish inside to outside. So you hit this area here, this little seam right there. Then right on the edge of the of the white. If you've got a nymphing rig, you can cast right into this and it'll help it get down faster, honestly. If you've got a dry dropper, you might not want to do that because it'll sink the dry fly. And then just work your way inside to the outside. Now, when I first started this type of fly fishing, I would look at a section of water like this and I would think, that's so low. There can't be anything in there. I'm not even going to bother. Uh, but now I look at this and I start to salivate because I know what is there. And if I, uh, if I look at this right now, I see a roughly a 50 yard stretch of water where I can possibly, if I'm careful, if I'm very methodical about it, I can pull out up to 15 fish out of this stretch. Probably and I'll show you how I do it. You know, first I'd hit this, uh, um, you know, working from inside to outside and then work that. And then I might reposition at, at certain points, you know, I might have to get in the water. Like at these points, you might have to zigzag and I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Uh, but if you basically work your way upstream and look at what's the next section of water I can hit, how can I hit that without disturbing it? And then move up to the next one without disturbing it. You can have so many opportunities at fish like right there. I could walk away having netted probably a dozen fish at least if I'm careful about it and not letting those fish run into these other areas. So um, for smaller pools though, let's, you know, take a look at this, these small pools, even though they're so, uh, you know, they look so good and I'm sure they're holding tons of fish. You have to be careful because they're typically one and done. So like I, in a section like this, I'll go straight for the head. I'll go for where those bigger fish are sitting. Uh, for instance, you know, this is a 15 inch wild brown that I got in a piece of water similar to this, just because I, I knew if I spook out this small section of water, I might not have a shot at the bigger fish that I think sitting at the head of it. So, um, you know, it, tiny, tiny little pieces of water like this, I'm, I'm just going to hit the prime water first, fish the head of it around these, this seam right here. So you got your slow water here, you got your slower water here, but the fast water right here. And then also eddies, you know, where you got your swirling water. A lot of times you just let a niffing rig or a dry dropper just swirl through here. You'll get some really nice fish. Um, this is just an example of uh, those plunge pools. You know, you've got really fast water pushing through here, but you got a slow drop off here. I will cast nymphs into that. So that suction drops those nymphs pretty quickly. And then I get a deep drift all the way through here. 
but hang on, I'm freezing again. Okay. Don't overlook the still water. This water doesn't move at all, but sometimes if you just, you know, I, I just bow and arrow a dry dropper in there and just let it sit. Something might notice it and absolutely smash it. Uh, I've only caught two, two wild tiger trout in my life. And one of them was right there. Uh, just came up and hammered a dry fly that I just let sit there for a good minute. Uh, um, pockets, pocket water, your slow water found behind obstructions, usually boulders. Like we, we've got a big boulder right here and this water, um, or sorry, th this area is the, it's prime feeding location for trout. Uh, you've got your increased strength of current on either side. So on the opposite side of the boulder, on this side, you've got faster current running through there and it funnels and pushes those insects into the pocket, the slower pocket right here. So if you want a long drift, a long, slow drift, you cast right behind that rock because you know there are fish sitting there just waiting to pick off those, those insects that are just kind of flying in through, through that faster water. But if you want to get into... Uh, you know, quicker, more natural drift cast to either side of the pocket. Sometimes if you're using a dry dropper, you know, you want to scrape that dry fly right along that rock because you know there's something sitting right in there. Uh, same thing with the indicator. You know, the closer you can get, even though you might snag, you might lose your fly. Well, on these small streams, honestly, if I get snagged, it's in a foot and a half of water. Uh, and I, I'll just kind of, you know, um, well, I'll, I'll use my tricks to, uh, you know, free the fly. But if that doesn't work, honestly, I just put my hand in the water and pull the fly out. Yeah. I've, I've kind of wrecked that spot, but I'm not leaving a fly in the water. Um, but yeah, pocket water, really effective, uh, for fishing these small streams, just like on bigger water. And that's, that's basically the same. Uh, I love undercuts because you're bigger, you're, you're, you're more wary, cautious trout are hiding in here. Um, and if you cast ahead of the undercut, like even further than that arrow, uh, you get your, you know, dry drop or sorry, your dropper or your nymphing rig down there by the time that you're under that undercut. And by the time my dropper got to this point, or sorry, by the time my dry fly got to this point, that trout had taken the dropper. You know, that's like a good eight, nine inch uh, small stream wild brown. That, that was a hard fighting fish. Uh, my favorite thing is inclines, your, your steep gradient with your plunge pool, you know, your, your plunge pools, you want to hit the bottom first. I hit that inside seam, the slow middle, the outside seam, then the far bank, you know, work inside to outside. But at this point, once I get done with that lower part, I'm climbing and repositioning so that I can hit the best spots uh, effectively without spooking any fish that I'm coming up upon. So after I hit this bottom piece, I'm going, I'm zigzagging, I'm, I'm repositioning. I might even cross the stream uh, to get into a better position. So the next spot I'm going to hit is this tiny little uh, plunge pool right here. This little tiny pool right here. It's going to hold fish. Even if there's really no current in there, they'll come up and whack a dry fly. And then after that, I'm going to turn and I'm going to hit this over here because you've got a nice little piece of water right there. You know, typically I'm, when I'm doing this, it's dry droppers because, um, I feel like that you just get a longer drift with the, the dry dropper. You get more time with it. Um, the nymphing rig, you know, you don't have to wait for it to get down sometimes in these small, tight little pools. Um, you're at the end of your drift by the time it, it gets, you know, it gets down there, but with the dry dropper, uh, you know, they'll come up, they'll hit it. And then after that, I've got, I'm zigzagging. I, I reposition, so I'm probably standing right about here, and I'm ready to hit this piece of water right here. It's tiny, but it's holding something. And then right after that, go just ahead over here. Oh, there we go. Got a nice pool right here. And then after that, I'm turning and looking, and I've got this right here. Nice little tiny bit of water, but it's yielded fish before. And then ending with... There's one right there. Nice little pool there. So this, I know this doesn't look like a lot, maybe to some people, but there are solid 10 opportunities to get your small stream wild trout there. So coming to the end, just a um, couple things about fighting, handling, and releasing these small stream mountain trout, uh, mountain stream trout. 
light hook sets are necessary because you're getting into tiny fish here. Uh, you don't want to rip them out of the water. You know, a lot of times people, I've seen people slingshot them right onto the bank because they're so small, just light flick of the wrist to set the hook and um, strip them in by hand. You're never really going to need the reel unless you get into one of those big monsters that there's probably a 75% chance you're not going to land anyway. Um, even them, I'm, I'm getting, I'm fighting them by hand to just try and get a little bit more control over them. But yeah, typically you're stripping in fish by hand. The reel is just the whole line. Um, you want to keep them wet, you know, as illustrated in this picture, when you net them, keep them underwater. You know, I, I, even before Instagram and social media was a thing, I love getting pictures of my fish as a kid. I had a little holster on my belt for my camera. I've always loved photographing them, but, um, you know, they're for me, my, my trout are always underwater, uh, until I'm ready to snap a quick picture in, in five seconds and then release them. So keeping fish wet is very important to me. Handle them with wet, bare hands, even in the winter. Uh, you know, if you use gloves, first thing I do when I land a fish, take them off, chuck the glove on the bank and handle it with my bare wet hands. Uh, you know, release them safely and quickly. I, one thing I, I don't notice uh, people mentioning enough is it's important to release them in moving water so that they can get that water flowing again. But sometimes I see people releasing them in too fast of water to the point where when that fish is put in the water, its head is turning because it's getting slammed by the current and it's exhausted. So I look for that piece of water that is moving, but not moving so fast to where the fish can't sit in it and, and get its, you know, get its breath and get its energy back and then swim off on its own. I, I typically don't let fish out of my hands until they you know, until they've shown me that they can wiggle out of my hand underwater, like they, that they've got the strength to swim off on their own. And then barbless hooks. I challenge anybody uh, watching this to use barbless hooks. I've been strictly barbless for over five years now, and it's made me a much better angler because realistically, you know, one of the complaints against barbless hooks, oh, you lose more fish. If you lose fish with barbless hooks, it's because of something you did wrong makes you a better angler, uh, makes you make less mistakes, makes you more conscious of what you're doing in the moment so that you don't release that pressure for a split second to where that, that hook can just fall out. And also, you know, the best part is you get the fish in the net. I'd say probably 90% of the time that that fly just falls out. But I don't even have to unhook the fish. They're, they're already unhooked by the time I go to handle them. And also if you hook yourself, that's not, there's no trip to the hospital there. You're just pulling it out. It's like sticking yourself with the tack. So barbless all the way. Can't stress that enough. And uh, I'll, I'll fly through this quickly because I know we're, we're getting short on time. Um, I typically like to fish small streams alone, but I have a few friends that I really enjoy uh, being out with on the water. I'm, even on those days where I'm looking for that recharge, where I'm looking to get out by myself. Uh, and my, uh, in this picture, we have my friend, Zach. And we're very good at coordinating. You know, th this isn't the type of water where you guys can put a lot of distance between yourselves or where, you know, two people can put a lot of distance between yourselves and, and fish because that person who's ahead may spook out the water that the person coming from behind may want to fish. So communication is key. And I highly recommend a couple of different approaches. Take turns at each section. I have no problem just sitting and watching Zach fish. Um, you know, like helping him, giving him pointers of, you know, maybe pass or maybe put your cast like right under that overhanging branch or whatever. Uh, I love watching, you know, people have success on the water. So, you know, we'll, one of us will sit down while the other fish is a section and we'll take turns, um, leapfrogging through sections, very specifically coordinating. Okay. Here's where we are. There are, you know, four spots that we can potentially fish in this like hundred yards. So you take the first one, I take the second, you take the third, I take the fourth. Coordinate. So nobody's stomping through anybody else's water. Nobody's spooking anybody's fish. And take turns. Another thing, if you can fish the same section, but take turns with different techniques. Like for instance, uh, one of us will put a dry dropper rig through first, and then the other will drag a nymphing rig through, you know, in the lower water column. So you could potentially get multiple fish each out of, you know, one section, just using two different techniques. Um, but wait for each other. Don't get too far ahead. I've been on, you know, both sides. I've been really excited and, oh, that's a great section of water up ahead. I want to fish that. I really want to hit that. Uh, and just forgot that I'm fishing with someone else. Uh, and then I've been the person who, Hey, you know, that person just keeps going and they're not communicating what they're doing. And, you know, we're not having a successful day. So it's really just being considerate. 
Uh, recognize that if you fish with a friend on these small streams, what may have been a 30 or 40 fish day for you drops down to a 15 to 20 fish day for you because you're splitting the fish between the two of you. So, um, you know, just, just be mindful of that. And in closing, uh, I just highly recommend that you, you practice and promote again using barbless, barbless hooks, rubber mesh netting, rubber soles, uh, you know, with or without studs, that's entirely up to you. I recommend with studs nowadays because you don't want to break a bone and be stuck out in the, in the wild. Um, be aware of spawning activity. You know, we talked about when brooks and browns are spawning in the fall, rainbows and cutties in the spring. And also when they're off those reds, their eggs are still in there. So, you know, even in the winter, if, if it's a spot with wild brown trout and brook trout, be mindful of the fact that those eggs are still there and they're still, uh, you know, not hatched yet. Also water temperatures and air temperatures in the warmer months, don't fish water above 67 degrees in the winter months. Be mindful of the fact that if you lift that fish out of the water, you could be freezing the water and it's gills. So, um, yeah, be careful there and handle with wet bare hands, keep the fish wet, use those proper release techniques and leave these areas how you found it. You know, carry out everything. I've got one of those little uh, fish pond garbage cans that I have on my pack that I just stuff my tippet and other garbage into. Um, and, you know, be careful about posting landmarks and GPS tags. Um, you know, these, these streams are special fragile ecosystems, they typically can't handle the levels of pressure that you see on those lower, uh, larger lowland streams. So, you know, be conscientious of that. Um, and, you know, we're lucky to have these fisheries and they, they need to be respected and protected. So uh, thank you so much for having me tonight and for, for viewing the presentation. Feel free, you know, if anyone has any questions tonight, we have a, the Q&A, obviously, but um, anything outside of that, feel free to reach out to me. You can contact me on Instagram. I usually reply to DMs within a couple hours um, or my email, which I think is on my Instagram too. But thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Wade. Um, we can open everything up to a Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, Wade, if you just want to stop your screen share, that way we can okay. see the gallery. Uh, how do I do that? Should be on the bottom there or the top. Yeah, it's on the top. Oh man, I am pause share. No, stop share. There we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Awesome presentation. Does anybody uh, have a question? You. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. Oh, thank you. People commenting about the safe release and handling, appreciating that. I think it's really important to share. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Adam's from the Chicago area. Um, you were talking about me measuring using your rod to measure your line or your tippet. And yeah, I know, I know that can be the way I explained it was probably kind of confusing. Yeah, could you just uh, okay? So, um, you know, you've go got ahead. your you've got your rod completely rigged up, you're ready to go, you've just got the fly hooked into the eyelet, the, the little <laughs> hook eyelet that's right above the rod handle. Um, real quick. I'm just going to grab a random rod because I've got them here. Of course, I grab, <laughs> I grab an eight weight. So you're ready to go. You've got, you've got the eyelet here where you throw your fly on. I mm -hmm. use that when, when the fly is hooked in there, I use that as a measurement. So I run my finger all the way up the, the leader and where that leader matches up with the fifth to last guide on the fly rod, mm -hmm. that's where I put the pinch on. So it's exactly, oh. it, the, if you measure from the hook eyelet to that fifth guide on my, my two weight, it's exactly 43 inches. So I know that if I go all the way up there, when the fly is, is hooked on to the eyelet, if I go mm -hmm. all the way up that leader to that fifth to last guide, um, I, that's where I can put my pinch on. Not, not, not the line in the guide, but like, I, I, I wish I had it. I understand what you're saying now. Yeah. 
Because it's, it's, it's in the leader part that you're measuring. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I, I, I just you. use it as a marker. Yeah. Okay. Super idea. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I feel like I like I was conscious of the timer at the end, so I felt like I was kind of rushing in the last like 15 minutes. But, um, but yeah, I hope hope that proves helpful uh, to everybody. Just I love those small streams. Like they're they're my absolute favorite. I, I'll, I'll take those waters over. You know, fighting for a spot on a, a bigger stream with my euro rod any day. I have a question. Go ahead, Jackie. First, wait, thank you very much. And it's my perennial question. What do you recommend to use for ticks and mosquitoes? Oh, see, that's that's an interesting thing. Um, I, well, in, mo in most months, I, um, like your, your colder months, I'm, I'm pretty covered, like from, uh, you know, head to toe. I've, I've got clothing. I always wear my hat and everything. I, I rarely ever find ticks on me and I never get bothered by mosquitoes. It's just, maybe they don't like my skin. Um, but last time I was out, there were these little gnats that it was two days in a row. I got out that just absolutely destroyed me. And I've still got some, some like bite marks and everything from them. I almost never get bothered. It's never an issue for me. I wish I had a recommendation because I never use any kind of bug spray. Uh, but then like two weeks ago, I got absolutely wrecked. By, by these gnats. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer, but yeah, ch ticks are, uh, I always check myself after I get off the water. Like, you know, that's something that's no joke. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I just, they hate my skin. So <laughs> I, uh, I like there. Wade, I have a question here from Janet. She was asking if you know of any videos out there available to learn the bow and arrow cast. Ah, uh, no, I, I don't. I, I I feel like I'm an old soul in in the fact that I I'm not one for like scanning YouTube. Uh, it's I wish yeah I, w I wish I had a resource there. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a, a super helpful uh helpful technique and like i said if you if you're not focused on shooting the line out like through the guides if you just if you have a fixed distance like for instance i might have six feet between my rod tip uh and the fly that i'm holding in my hand and i'm looking to just shoot six feet ahead of me um you're, you're not trying to you know take a, a six inch or six foot um cast and slingshot it into a 15 or 20 foot that's that's where you lose control so just control that distance that you're putting out or that that amount of line that you're putting out there restrict it that's that's my best advice for that okay maybe you'll yeah. create a video for us sometime yeah I, I feel like also, I'll, I'll, i feel like i'm falling short here because i don't also, have uh, someone commented that orvis has some great videos on youtube so maybe check that out or um, you know, just Google it, but I'm sure there's lots of videos out there as well. They're, they're how to fly fish, uh, videos, like their introductory videos are, are really helpful. I've used those, um, for the fishing club that I have at my school. Yeah. Yeah. The bow and arrow is tricky. It takes time. One of the first times I tried to use it was out West in Alberta, uh, casting bowing, bow and arrow casting streamers to, bull trout on a seven foot uh, or seven foot six, eight weight glass rod. And it was an absolute mess. I, I ruined my chance. Uh, it did not work, uh, but I got really good at it with my one weight and my two weight. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other questions? So thank you again, Wade, so much. Uh, in closing, I just want to mention again, July 5th is our presentation for uh, the next month's virtual monthly United Women on the Fly event, and that's going to be Keep Fish Wet. Also, YouTube, subscribe and like for United Women on the Fly. And then also follow Wade on Instagram and check out his IGTV, The Drag Free Drift. Thank, Thank you so much, Wade. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight.